Okay, so if you are here for the um, uh, virtual tour of Ireland, then you're in the wrong place, right? Let's make sure everybody's here for the right reason. Uh, this is our Pride and Prejudice program. Um, I wanna say hello to everyone. I'm sure there will be more people joining us, but we'll get rolling. Uh, my name is Jerry Bradsky, and I'm the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs Inclusion Initiative Chair. And I was co-chair of the FJMC WLCJ Women's League Inclusion Initiative Committee. Uh, Karen was the other co-chair and she'll join us here and have part of the presentation in a little while, in a little bit. Um, wanna welcome you to the first of several quarterly one hour sessions that we call Pride and Prejudice. There's so much we're going to try to squeeze into our hour. So we'll try to uh, get through everything uh, in, in, in short order here. Um, I'll explain what we're doing in a minute, but first let's just quickly review Zoom etiquette, okay? As an attendee, please stay muted. Um, we don't need to hear, you know, the dog barking or, um, you know, other, other noises. So please stay muted. Our presenter panelists will unmute themselves when they're talking, but everyone else should stay muted. We appreciate that. It looks like we have enough screens uh, and we'll have enough screens as we get going that if you have quite, when you have questions, please put them in the chat and I'll try to keep track of the chat. Also, let me ask that you please save the chat for your questions, okay? If you have some comment on the chat, that's just gonna slow me down in getting to the questions uh, as I try to scan through there. So again, let's keep the chat for questions if we can, not just you know stray comments that you might have. Um, your video can be off, that's not a problem, right? That, you know, that's okay with us. Uh, but we do want you to set your screen for speaker view. Okay, I'm going to do that now myself. Set it for speaker view so that you can see whoever is talking, you know, the speaker much more clearly because there'll be a bundle of screens showing up uh, here. Um, so you want to set it for speaker view. Uh, and when I when we do screen share, that will kind of suck up half your screen already anyway. Um, uh, and if you know how to slide that one way or the other, that'll work for you too. But if you don't, that's no problem, okay? Speaker view, and we will uh, be using your screen here in a little bit, okay? Um, so while you're doing all that, let me catch you up on how we got here this evening. About a year and a half ago, um, Federation Jewish Men's Club's first vice president, Alan Budman, who's on the call here with us, began to gather a committee to discuss inclusion. He asked Women's League, and USCJ to join us. Women's League did. USCJ ran with their own parallel but separate initiative, which is fine, and they're very active in sharing with clergy and synagogue leaders at this time, uh, you know, issues about inclusion. So we're every, everybody's good. Um, but the reason I mention all three is that really all three of these arms of of, uh, of conservative Judaism are working working together or parallel. On inclusion, it's it's a big issue, and and I, I think you're going to say it should be. Um, so our committee consisted of uh, FJMC and Women's League leaders and members, and several months later, it produced an inclusion resource guidebook, an inclusion resource guidebook. It also uh, included a list of organizational resources. We'll we'll see all these things here in, in a minute. Um, places you could go for specific initiatives like trips to Israel for young people with disabilities or places that focus specifically on one traditionally marginalized community or another. Uh, there's Jews in All Hues. That's an organization that you can you can guess is is uh, is processing uh, 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 Jews of color and and how we uh, how we can work with that issue for all of us uh, to be positive and welcoming. By the way, when you see our work, you'll notice we focused in on being more welcoming to everyone, but specifically, we were concerned about how we welcome or don't Jews of color, members of the LGBTQIA plus community, physically and neuro-challenged individuals, and folks in non-traditional family situations. I love that last one because it's non-traditional family situations, which frankly are becoming more traditional than non-traditional, aren't they? Um, we all know there are others who feel marginalized sometimes. Um, we have friends who struggle financially and don't sometimes feel fully welcomed, right? We have adults who often just don't fit in with a crowd. 
Uh, sometimes we fail to notice someone outside the circle as we socialize with our friends. You know what I mean. And, and that's another kind of marginalized group of folks and we wanna be welcoming. Um, I just had a conversation uh, uh, with, with one of the guys. And when I used the term modern family, he said, you mean my mixed up family? And I said, no, it's not a mixed up family. Um, it, no longer no longer are families Ozzie and Harriet. You know, if you think your family is going to be like that for long term, you're disillusioned because it's, it's a pretty rare person who doesn't have a modern family within their children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, who they marry, who's in that person's family, kids and adults with physical or neuro issues to handle. Just something that was traditionally marginalized socially that is no more. We have to realize that we need to be fully accepting and welcoming to everyone. And we have to help our friends and in, in our congregations also do that. Just remember, as Smokey the Bear says, only you can prevent embarrassing yourself. Uh, okay, that well, we won't. I, I see a couple of smiles, but yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pass that one. Tonight, we want to focus on being more welcoming, even though we think we already are. You know, we're always saying, what are we always saying? We'd like more and younger members, right? We're always saying we'd like more of our members to be engaged in our programming and in our leadership. We believe we're open-minded and welcoming, but we know there's room for improvement. There's lots of room for improvement. These presentations that we do quarterly should help you in all these areas. Okay, so we're gonna show you tonight how to access inclusive resources through the FJMC's website. Um, Karen's going to tell you that, that things are up and running on the Women's League website as well, okay? And that they're moving affiliates into the inclusion initiative. And then we have two presenters tonight, uh, uh, Jerry and Janet, who will share inclusion successes they've experienced in their synagogues. We'll take your questions on the chat, please. And if we have time at the end, we'll open up the mic for comments. We call this Pride and Prejudice. Now with apologies to Jane Austen, who I hope is fine with us borrowing her book title. I mean, I tried to call her, she didn't return. We call it Pride and Prejudice because number one, we wanna take time to share proud moments where we feel we indeed are moving our own needle forward in our quest to be more welcoming to everyone. And two, we want to put our prejudging prejudice out on the table, in the open, so we can practice not prejudging people and communicating to everyone that indeed everyone is welcome in our clubs, affiliates, and synagogues, and our lives. Okay, first up, let me share some of the resources that are available on the FJMC website. You can see this, right? Do I see a few heads nodding? Okay, good. You can see this. So here's the FJMC website. This is the screen that you'll see on the FJMC website for inclusion. And the reason I wanted to show it to you is because in the upper left-hand corner here, uh, if, you, if you would go to programs, go to inclusion, and this is what'll pop up, you see that the inclusion resource guidebook here in the upper left-hand corner shows, and you can just click on that and you can go right to our guidebook, which I'll show you in a minute. Also the outreach organizations, there's a sample press release if you wanna kind of think about marketing. There's a self-assessment that we'll go over today uh, for a few minutes. If you want a speaker to come, uh, Fran Hildebrand from, from Women's League was the, was the head of this subcommittee and she put together a speaker's bureau request form and we have some speakers if you want that. Um, and if you want some signage for in front of your synagogue, we have that too. So that's sitting there on the website Okay, and it will tell you all kinds of things and it links to important stuff. So here's the report, here's the, here are the guidelines. And what does it say? 34 pages. It starts out looking uh, like this. It's from the FJMC and Women's League and uh, look at all the people that worked on it. And it starts to go through with the table of contents, a couple of page executive summary, um, mission statement, but the biggest part of it are suggested programs, okay? And you can go through on the, on, the, on the website, you can go through and click on anything that you see that sounds interesting and it will take you to the annotated version of that information. So if, it, if, if Jews of color is a topic you kind of want to process in your club or with your synagogue, we go through lots of then information in here uh, that will help you ponder that, okay? So that's the 
inclusion resource guide sitting on the website. Um, and it's 34 pages of pretty practical information. Okay, I mentioned the outreach organizations. So I just grabbed a few here for you to take a look at. Many of you know about Keshet, which helps you serve LGBTQIA plus individuals. Uh, they specifically are designed to help you work through those questions, those processes, that sensitivity, all of that. Um, I highlighted a couple more here for you that are sitting there on this document that's in, on the website to promote full inclusion for young people uh, for B'nai Mitzvahs, okay? There's an inclusion guide on how to do that, how to, again, walk through this process from this organization. And if I slide over, we even have then the phone number, the websites for these organizations so that you can easily uh, contact them, okay? Uh, if you're looking for an inclusion trip to Israel for some of your kids that uh, have some challenges, Here's a program through USCJ that is an immersive inclusion trip to Israel for conservative teens. Um, and again, there's the website for USCJ on there. And, uh, you know, I don't want to take too much time, but we did put together a good couple of pages of resources that serve some of these groups uh, that, you know, individually we might not be able to answer questions about. Okay. Um, then the, one of the more popular items that's sitting on the site we have discovered is the self-assessment. So in the 34 page document, there are, hold on, 23, 27, 27 uh, suggested programs. Hold on, I won't make you too dizzy here. Let me get back to where I was. 27 suggestions about how you might improve what you do for at your club level, affiliate level, or synagogue with respect to inclusion. So the self-assessment lets you take this five-page little document and walk through one at a time, whether you think you're okay or not okay, and what maybe you want to do about that. So let's look at a couple of these. I just grabbed some in the middle. Number 13 says, support on behalf of men's clubs and women's league affiliates, the name mitz vote for children with learning and other disabilities by reaching out to their families to welcome them within their comfort level into the synagogue's regular program or alternative options. Jerry Ehrenberg's gonna tell you a little about his success in this. And connect them to parents who have already been through the experience. Connect them to parents that have already been through the experience. So those parents can say, this, is, this works real well. My kid or my adult son or whatever uh, really enjoys it. So with respect to bringing B'nai Mitzvot for children with learning and other disabilities into the regular family. Are we okay or not okay? Where are we on this continuum? And maybe we should what? And again, Jerry's going to specifically talk about this one at some point here a little in a few minutes. Number 14 is campaign for inclusion of young people with mental or physical challenges into religious school, social events, and youth groups. We know that oftentimes kids with these challenges sit at home by themselves, don't have a lot of friends, um, so one of the items that our group came up with was to encourage ourselves to be okay and do well with this. Program ourselves into thinking about the religious school, about the social events and the youth groups. You know that in the public schools, we've done a lot of this, right? We've done a lot of this to make sure that all kids feel they can be a part of these groups, um, okay? Um, are we okay or not okay with our club at our synagogue? And maybe we should do something about that. What do you think? Number 15 says, integrate children and adults with special physical and mental challenges into the regular service as much as possible. Okay, a little bit overlap here. Are we okay or not okay? And maybe we should. There are lots of other things. I'll just do one more, one more of the, of the 27. Um, conduct, this is hearing men's voices. HMV stands for Hearing Men's Voices. It's a program that, men, that the FJMC has that gives guys an opportunity to talk about some stuff that typically guys don't talk about, process stuff that typically guys don't exactly put out into the open. So this, there is a lesson plan about inclusion. Do we, do we conduct Hearing Men's Voices sessions on inclusion uh, of one or more communities we've identified? such as mental and physical wellness modules, including addiction, discussing our own challenges and that of others we know. I hate to say it, but all of us know folks in these marginalized communities, they're either part of our family, part of our friends, 
or we know they're out there and we don't really connect with them. Okay, so this is saying maybe we should conduct, a, you know, a, a, one of our little one hour sessions or whatever at our club level uh, on a hearing men's voices. And there's a lesson plan. In fact, I can show it to you here before we leave. There's a lesson plan about this if you think that's something you want to do. There are 27 of these kinds of things in the self-assessment. I just wanted to mention a few to you so that you could uh, identify which of these things you might want to utilize. All on the FJMC website. Give me a second. And where is that hearing men's voices here? Let me share that with you just because it's kind of interesting. Right? So... Here, this is this is a little lesson plan for a club. Uh, again, you know, the 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 ladies could use it, uh, you know, or or adjust. You know, Karen and Women's League could adjust the, this. The, and I think Women's League, I think Karen will tell us Women's League does similar programming. So, our, feel free to steal our 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 little lesson plan, Karen. That's not a problem. We're asking ourselves to express some feelings and opinions in a safe place about being inclusive. OK, so let's just take what it's, it's how it starts out. We know that most of us feel we're open minded and inclusive, but ask anyone inside, ask anyone inside a traditionally marginalized community of individuals, and you will likely get information that shows we're not. In fact, deep down, we know we're not. When we encounter an, autis an autistic child, we often create more space between ourselves and that child. When we see a Jew of color, we typically see and think about his skin color before any other characteristic of him. When we plan a program, we usually don't even consider that physically challenged members won't be able to participate. When we joint program with sisterhood, we don't often ponder how uncomfortable participation might be for an unmarried guy. Okay, so it's this kind of stuff. And then later on in the lesson plan, we discuss some of these things, right? We ask people, who do you know in some of these areas? Or have you been in a situation where you were a marginalized community member and, and, and felt weird about that. So um, that's the Hearing Men's Voices little lesson plan that is sitting on the FJMC website uh, under Hearing Men's Voices. Um, okay, let me let me shut up now and we'll let's turn to our panelists. So let's go to Karen first. Karen will unmute herself. She's the co-chair of the FJMC uh, Women's League Inclusion Initiative Committee. And she's bringing us the latest information about Women's League's parallel efforts to bring inclusion to its synagogue affiliates. Karen. Um, well, good evening, everyone. And um, thank you for inviting me to be on this panel. I will just start with, in 2021, Federation of Jewish Men's Club Inclusion Committee invited Women's League for Conservative Judaism to be part of the new Inclusion Committee project. I came on board the end of 2021, and Jerry Brodsky and I have been collaborating since as co-chairs to ensure follow through with the inclusion resource guidebook and follow up material for each of our websites. As Jerry said, Fran Hildebrand um, was on the inclusion committee since the beginning as she is Women's League Mishpacha chair. Fran, Fran then also became chair of the Speakers Bureau subcommittee, which Jerry mentioned. Other Women's League members, and I want to give a shout out to them, who joined the Inclusion Committee are Ariana Burroughs, Denise Brand, Nancy Goldberg, and Geraldine Payne. Women's League has had several initiatives so far. Since Women's League is structured a bit differently from MJFJMC, more geared to our WLCJ members, Fran Hildebrand, who chairs the Women's League Mishpacha Committee, has had and is continuing to have programs dealing with inclusion and encouraging our sisterhood affiliates and regions to also have programs. Fran has already presented a description of the inclusion program to the Women's League International Board of Directors, and I have presented to the 13 region presidents, as well as to the board of one of those regions. 
The speakers trained through the Inclusion Project Speakers Bureau have plans to present to the other regions as well as the sisterhood affiliates that make up the Women's League membership. The weekly WLCJ newsletter that goes out to our members is linked to the inclusion initiative, which is located on our website. Our newsletter and the website are constantly being updated as we get feedback from our membership. We have been having an ongoing series of programs about inclusion. Fran has collaborated with Vivian Lieber of Personal Conversations, another Women's League program, to present a panel of Jewish women of color and uh, that she did that last spring. And last week, the Mishpacha Committee presented a training to our membership that was very well attended, titled Exploring LGBTQIA Plus Identities. Their next program, Going Deeper, LGBTQIA Plus Language and Pronouns, will be on Sunday, April 23rd at 7.30 p.m. Jewels in the Crown, chaired by Ann Schimberg and myself, and I'm not sure how I get myself into these things, Jerry. Um, anyway, it's an initiative created as an incentive to showcase programming in our sisterhood affiliates. Included this year is the addition of a program on inclusion as one of the criteria to qualify and be selected as a jewel in the crown sisterhood recipient. These sisterhoods are honored at our WLCJ convention every three years, this year in July in Schaumburg, Illinois. There will be a designated time during WLCJ convention when the Mishpacha committee will have an inclusion program using the new WLCJ FJMC inclusion guidebook as a resource. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our panel representing underserved communities will discuss what we can do to talk the talk and begin the conversation about how to be more inclusive. We'll follow up with strategies and best practices that participants can take with them to try within their own sisterhoods and synagogues. Fran, as chair of the committee, will be moderating this program. And finally, to access the Women's League website, which is very much like the um, men's club website, uh, you can go to www.wlcj.org. You click on the resources drop down box to find the WLCJ FJMC Inclusion Initiative. And I'll write that in the chat. If you have any questions or would like more information on our part um, of the Inclusion Initiative, I will also put my email address in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, if you have questions along the way, just throw them into the chat as well. We will go to Dr. Ehrenberg. Jerry uh, is the inclusion chair at B'nai Yashurin Congregation in Pepper Pike, Ohio. Uh, and um, he's bringing us the successful inclusion initiatives his synagogue has initiated, has implemented. And uh, he'll probably tell us some things about some things that he'd like to be doing. Jerry. He is Jerry with the J. I'm Jerry with the G. That's how we differentiate ourselves in the synagogue. I'm very pleased to be able to uh, share all this with you. Um, I came to this because of my prior work, prior to my retirement. I was a child neurologist with a special interest in Tourette syndrome and children with neurodevelopmental disorders. So. I had a lot of prior experience working with people with special needs. Uh, of all the volunteer work that I've done uh, in our community, in our synagogue, this has been the most rewarding. I have found it so. But basically, there are two issues. One is 
physical changes that one must make in order to provide access, but there are also programmatic changes that require changes in both attitudes and things of this sort. It's a little easier to talk about the physical changes, so let me start with that. We're fortunate because our synagogue is a single floor, no steps to walk up to get into the synagogue, uh, but we pretended that we were in a wheelchair trying to get into our synagogue, and we also had some vision and hearing problems. So the first thing we encountered was we couldn't open the door. Uh, the doors were gifts, they're very heavy, and any normal person has a hard time opening them. Uh, once the door was open for these people and they got in, the space in the foyer prior to the second opening with glass was too, too narrow for a wheelchair. So that's been our most costly renovation. We put in an electronic door, which our rabbi said uh, we could use on Shabbat, uh, and we also lengthened the foyer. So those were the two things we did almost right away. Uh, we then um, saw that uh, if the person in the wheelchair needed an uh, aliyah, there wasn't going to be an opportunity because of the word on one floor, the bima was elevated by five steps. So we brought the Torah table down to uh, the floor, to the main floor, so everyone has access to the Torah table, and manually you can raise and lower it. So even a person in the wheelchair can have the Torah table lowered to a point where he or she can read from the Torah. We installed a hearing loop, a T-coil, uh, in our uh, sanctuary and several of our other uh, rooms. And this has been wonderful. I myself use it. And it makes it very much easier for anybody with a hearing impairment to be able to participate in the service. Uh, we obtained large print prayer books. We also provided magnifiers. And then the next question was, well, where does this person sit? So we also set aside areas within the main sanctuary that could accommodate uh, caregivers and persons in wheelchairs. Another thing that cost us some money, but wasn't that expensive, is we put in a gender neutral uh, bathroom on the first floor. And we also use that for families as a changing place. Um, and that's also been very, very successful. Um, there are two things that we tried that didn't work out and we abandoned them. One is it was perceived by everybody that transportation was a major hindrance to some of our senior members, especially from getting to the synagogue. So for six months, we had a trial program where we had a van available to take anybody who wished from their home to the synagogue and back. It turns out we were wrong. Uh, only a couple of people used it. It was not cost effective and then we gave it up. The other thing everyone told us to do was to have a quiet room for young people who are noise sensitive and needed to be taken away. So we tried that too. No one ever used it. So we gave up on that. We are, we have what's called a pit in the back of our synagogue that the kids love to run around in. And that's kind of the uh, place they would like to go. So in addition to that, there are the issues of the programmatic changes. And of course, as you would recognize, the very first thing you have to do is get the complete adherence to this program from your clergy. Uh, and I would also say the executive director. So we've been very fortunate because our rabbis and our executive director have been uh, fully behind this initiative. Our rabbi has given several very forceful sermons on the subject um, during the Shabbat services. And a number of people have written about inclusion in, uh, to be included in our newsletter at time to time. Another thing we were able to do was to provide sensitivity training for people in our synagogue. We partnered with a group called Yachad. Yachad is a national initiative sponsored by the Orthodox Union, and their goal is to work with disabled older teenagers and adults. Uh, we have an active one here in our community, and we have partnered with them, and they have provided us with uh, uh, persons who provide sensitivity training. So we provided that a year ago for our board members and clergy 
and staff, including facility staff as well. Uh, and we're going to repeat that now in the coming months and include it uh, as being open to the entire congregation. So hopefully that will be something that uh, is also going to be very, very helpful. The one thing I'll end with, which we're very proud of, is the program that we call our Inclusion Shabbat. We started now about three years ago. We have this special Shabbat once every two months. We have partnered with Jeff, JFSA. They have what's called a Youth Ability Program, where they have young adults with disabilities. Uh, they, as well as our own members, participate in this. We have used a special Shidur um, that we borrowed from Rabbi Michael Unger, uh, formerly a rabbi in Columbus. Um, the service itself takes 30 minutes, and all the reading parts, Hebrew and English, are done by the young people themselves. One of our uh, rabbis uh, is in charge, uh, our educational rabbi, Josh Foster, does a wonderful job, and in 30 minutes, we're finished. Uh, it is probably the most rewarding service I go to, and uh, I actually like it better than the other Friday night service as well. Now, not everything's been done, obviously. I think, uh, and I've told this to Jerry Brodsky, that we've kind of picked a low, low hanging fruit, and it's for the easy things to do. We have not, as a congregation, for various reasons, yet tackled the issues of how to deal with intermarriage, with Jews of color, the things we've been talking about all this period in time. So I think we're off to a good start, and I'm hopeful that perhaps we'll hear other suggestions that we can take up in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Jerry. We will hand the floor over to Janet. Janet Gunner is a uh, tri-state region inclusion leader, past president of Temple Beth Sedek in Buffalo, uh, bringing us uh, successful inclusion initiatives her congregation has implemented. Janet. Yes, thank you so much. And I love learning from your speakers. And I just wanted to mention, we were fortunate at Beth Sedek to build a a large um, new building attached to um, a previous synagogue building that we merged with. And our I love um, the description that Jerry provided of the um, removing barriers and the approach you took. And I just wanted to mention that our we no longer have an ele elevated BIMA um, so that everyone accesses the BIMA um, the, in the same way. And that was, we just had a wonderful opportunity to be able to do that. I, you know, I've um, learned so much from you and I love the inclusion guide resource that you mentioned. So uh, you're doing great work. I know that inclusion and belonging are our daily pursuit um, for all of us. And the most significant opportunity I have had in this area has been through my volunteer work as a founding member and then chair and co-chair of Kesher Inclusion at Temple Beth Zedek. Kesher means connection. It was created as a committee in the summer of 2000 to strengthen connections with all members of our synagogue community, but it was especially created to reduce the painful isolation that often accompanies loss, illness, frailty, disability, and care provider duties. By way of example, a basic important role of synagogue clergy and often the Hesed Committee of Volunteers is to visit those who are ill, Bikor Halim. But we discovered that often when persons leave the hospital or rehab, when an acute illness becomes a long-term disability, there is often no longer a meaningful continuing connection with the synagogue community. On a personal note, during that time around the year 2000, I was motivated by my own transformation from being a typical young mother of one child and working part-time as an attorney to then having twins and becoming the mother of three with my twin son, Daniel, having autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, and a seizure disorder. Suddenly I was experiencing firsthand the pain of isolation that accompanies having intellectual disability and the behavior challenges of autism or having a family member with these challenges. In creating Kesher with other interested synagogue members, I discovered, however, to my great joy and relief, a compassionate community that wanted to replace that isolation with belonging. 
the friendships I've made through my Kesher work and the work itself over these past two decades have been the most profound and gratifying on my life journey. So I'm just gonna share with you um, the approach that we've taken, that Kesher has taken that seems to have been successful. And I'll give you a snapshot of our um, programs with some guiding principles that have been helpful to us. We are always continuing to evolve and fine tune and we certainly face challenges as well. But the first is that we continually survey the synagogue landscape to determine Kesha related needs that our synagogue is uniquely qualified to address. I think it's important that programs to develop, um, it's important for programs to develop organically from individuals we are trying to reach rather than to create a program that serves only those who fit into it. And here are some examples. Um, you know, Bikor Halim, of course, visiting hospital rehab and um, phone pals where caring members call members who are more homebound on a regular basis. We have Kesher Communications. One volunteer has been sending personal cards at times of Simca loss and illness for over 20 years. Another volunteer sends birthday cards to members 80 and over, totaling over 200 cards last year. We have an older congregation. And a third volunteer sends birthday cards to members with special needs, all helping to melt away painful isolation. Our Shiva Shabbat Passover kosher meal program connects our members to powerful Jewish traditions of providing Shiva and Shabbat and holiday meeting meals at important times. Our chair of this program makes calls each week to families at times of loss for Shiva meals, but also to send over Shabbat meals when members return home from the hospital or rehab or experience serious illness or injury. We also send over Shabbat meals to celebrate the Simchas of births and adoptions. This past year, 176 meals were delivered by a team of volunteers. A transportation network, and I agree with Jerry that that's a challenge. Um, we are trying to have that reemerge after COVID, um, we have a group of volunteers who are ready to drive members to and from synagogue services and events. And this also strengthens relationships within our community. Our holiday home hospitality program, there's always a seat at the table of a member family for a member who would otherwise be alone for high holiday Passover and Thanksgiving meals. Our second um, guiding principle is we continually survey the landscape of our congregational families to tap the passions and talents of our members to address these identified needs. Our numerous um, and varied programs are chaired and supported by our many lay leaders and volunteers. We couldn't do it without Kesher itself being fully inclusive, which brings me to a key underpinning of Kesher's longevity. It's our third guiding principle that every member of our synagogue community is a member of Kesher, at times providing services, at times receiving services. We ask members to volunteer in the area that resonates, and we are grateful for all levels of participation. As a result, our entire congregation has taken ownership of Kesher. It's not a committee. Kesher is what our synagogue does. And what an amazing talent pool this yields. For example, for many years, our approximately 100 and 130 high holiday and Shavuot deliveries to members with disability, illness, frailty, and loss had Kesher baked Hala as a centerpiece. Those Hala bakes, which included volunteers of all ages, because everyone of all ages is a member of Kesher, were led by master Hala baking lay leaders. Our outstretched arm program for Jews with special needs includes the uplifting music of our klezmer and other talented musician congregants. During the pandemic, another lay leader used his talents to produce community videos so that the outstretched arm program could continue virtually. And that same member led the sing-along at the Women's Jewish Group Home Havdalah sing-along program. Another lay leader now has one-on-one -on -one teaching instruction for Jewish adults with special needs as part of our lifelong learning program. She's recruited 10 talented volunteer teachers for about 14 students. The um, fourth, and I just have a few more um, principles to share that we follow when members of our community are no longer able to attend our services or programs at our building due to frailty, disability, or illness, even with a ride, we create programs that are located where they reside. And if the program would be more meaningful, if tailored to their special needs, we strive to meet that goal. Importantly, in both cases, we bring 
celebration, learning, and community to the individuals. And a couple of examples, we had um, a monthly Mincha program at the Assisted Livy Weinberg campus, and then a separate Talmud and Torah program led by the rabbi and um, volunteers were at the Mincha program as the yearning for lifelong learning, community relationship and observance, of course, are not diminished by frailty or disability. Our outstretched arm program is in now in its 22nd year. It celebrates Sukkot, Hanukkah, Purim, Shavuot and Shabbat together as community and is chaired by my Kesher co-chair, Charlotte Bleichfeld. Outstretched arm activities are adapted to ensure that Jewish people of all abilities can participate in meaningful ways in our beloved Jewish traditions and this brings me to number five, know the mem we try to know the members of our community and any special accommodations they will need to participate. Charlotte sends out invitations to every program, but then she calls to personally invite each guest. She asks about their well-being and whether they will need any special accommodation to attend. Some persons with special needs who at one time could, 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 eat, could eat food without any special accommodation now need food pureed. So Charlotte bought a food processor and recruited a volunteer to process food at the event. Other individuals no longer are eating food orally. So Charlotte arranged for special activities during the lunch portion of the program. And you know, my, what we try to share in our community is that anyone who works at a member service agency to know their membership, ask members to indicate preferred pronouns, needed accommodations when they join, but then go through the membership list at least twice a year and update it. If you haven't seen someone in some time, give them a call. Work to proactively provide seamless inclusion. For example, Jewish agencies with camp programs should call member families of children with disability to see if they would like to attend and what accommodations would be needed. Likewise, synagogues should confer with the parents of a child with disability years before the child is eligible for religious school to plan for and ensure that a special ed teacher and one-on-one -on -one aid and other accommodations as needed are in place for the student to begin on time. Parents, and I speak about this personally, parents um, should not have to advocate for these placements and accommodations. Parents, care providers, and individuals with disabilities are exhausted and at times shy about asking for accommodations. As a mother of a child with autism, I never wanted my son to in interfere with um, classrooms or, you know, I was shy and timid um, about that. So the most compassionate approach is to anticipate and proactively reach out to plan in partnership with seamless inclusion. And now to finish up with just a few last number six, we always um, should be budgeting for accommodations as a cost of the program. It should not be considered an extra only if money is available because of course, inclusion is for everyone and therefore budget should cover costs for everyone's participation. And the last guiding principle that we follow is we are, wanna be fully collaborative and partner regularly with Jewish Federation, community agencies and synagogues. And our some examples are Kesher, LGBTQ+, subcommittee, um, works with the regularly with the community. Our, we have a partnership with Jewish Family Services where JFS is at our synagogue twice a week to serve our membership. And we partner with Buffalo Jewish Federation embracing and supporting the women's Jewish group home and the future men's Jewish group home, which um, we're working um, very actively on. And then to end, I just wanted to suggest a goal for us all, um, this is from the original, from the originator of Jewish Disability Awareness um, and Inclusion Month, which we're in currently, Shelley Christensen. She emphasized in her book, From Longing to Belonging, that it is important to pursue both structural inclusion, removing barriers, and the spirit of belonging. Ms. Christensen writes, belonging is based on relationships within the community that encourage and empower people with disabilities and mental health conditions to participate like anyone else. Belonging occurs when community members build relationships with people with disabilities, listening to what is important to them and how they wanna be involved. On structural inclusion, I encourage us all to emulate our Buffalo Jewish Federation's proactive practice of asking each program re registrant with follow-up whether any accommodations are needed to make the program experience meaningful. And finally, inclusion and belonging will endure 
only if we all embrace the role. Thank you so much. Thank you, Janet. Thank you very much. It's a good thing I have this recorded, Janet, because I couldn't keep uh, take, I couldn't get notes fast enough. Great, great, great suggestions. We have some questions for the three of you. Um, let me and some comments. So let me walk through. Let me start with Karen. Um, Karen, uh, the, the question is: Sometimes the guys will call me and say, "Jerry, um, I, I know we've communicated to really, I think, all our men's clubs. You know, we have over over four hundred internationally international uh, men's clubs." And, and uh, I think we've communicated with all of them because we have regional meetings and we've talked to the presidents. They said, but several of them called me and said the sisterhood affiliates at their synagogue hadn't gotten the word yet. Um, what, what should I say to them? Should they contact somebody or just go to the website or are they going to be or uh, you know, communicated with a little more or... I mean, I'm sure there. I'm sure there are places where the sister is going to hear about it, and the men's club hadn't hasn't gotten the word yet. So, any any answer for me to say to these folks? Um, well, the the one thing that I will say, it just it took us a little bit longer to get um, everything up on the website, but it is up there. It's very prominently displayed. Um, and we have, I think um, I mentioned it when I was talking before, uh, plans to make sure that every sisterhood affiliate will have information. Uh, it's an ongoing process, but it will happen. Great. So that's what I can tell them. I appreciate that. It's already on the website and it's coming. Great. Um, let me go to Jerry Ehrenberg. The question, well, first of all, Jerry, when you said the... Um, uh, you put yourself in a wheelchair, I, I, you know, to to walk through what the needs might be. I, I think that's really um, just a, a great metaphor for what we want to do about any um, what we called marginalized community, right? Put ourselves in people's shoes and uh, what are the needs? So, you know, I thought that was really I, that was really a good process that you used. The other thing you said was, well, we tried a couple things that didn't work. Oh well. Um, and I think that's important for people to learn, too, that not everything's going to work everywhere. Uh, you know, we've got 27 suggestions in our report, but that's not for everybody, you know, not all 27. So I thought that was really good. Um, you mentioned that, um, that there's a, I don't know how to say this exactly, but the question is the low-hanging fruit. You, you said low-hanging fruit, and then you mentioned some things that are harder to process. What do you think What's your suggestion for folks when they identify the same issue, that they can handle autistic kid issues because they can work on that, that's pretty acceptable, but some of these others are a little bit more challenging. What, do you have a suggestion for us? Well, obviously I don't because if I did, we would have done it at our synagogue. Um, our synagogue is in a particular situation. We had some major issues with our senior rabbi during the past year. Uh, some of you may have heard about it, and so it's really kind of detracted our um, the, the clergy and our uh, board from some of the things they needed to do. No, I think the only thing I could recommend is persistence. persistence. Just keep asking, keep going, and seeing what happens. Uh, I'd like Good. to add something of Janet. How big is your community? I was really impressed by how warm and welcoming it is. Uh, yeah, I think we have close to 500 member families wow that's good one of our problems just to speak to your point is we often don't know what's going on with our members now we we're bigger we have about 900 families but um you would think that we would know better and one of the things i've been frustrated with is that the persons who seem to know the most about this are the clergy but they often reluctant to share that with anybody because they feel that the family does not particularly want the community to know that they're having this trouble or that. How have you overcome that? Sure, that's a, a great question. We put together a very small Bikor Halim volunteer group, and then the clergy are part of that, and there's an administrative assistant in our office who coordinates it, and she puts out a weekly Bikor Halim update, which is strictly confidential. It stays within our group. And we have on it, we have a short-term list and a long-term list. So the short-term list has people who are in hospitals and rehab, 
and people who are back at home, but it's still in the recovery acute stage. The long-term list has over a hundred people on it, people with frailty, people with developmental disabilities. And that comes out every week. And at the times of the year, before COVID, um, we did these major deliveries for Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah and Shavuot. We would use those two opportunities to update it. We go through the entire congregation and say, you know, who haven't we seen? Um, the person who calls for meals, you know, our volunteer who has the meal program, she, we all have input in trying to update our list. And then we make deliveries to them. With COVID, we sent out cards and made calls to people. We have to, but in any event, we have this weekly confidential Be Careful Lean list um, that has, you know, volunteers who, you know, the volunteer who sends cards out to everyone, she's on that list. And those lists, our, our clergy have indicated that those lists are so helpful to them. And the, the rabbi and the cantor coordinate visits and calls from those two lists. Just one more follow-up question, I'll be quiet. Uh, how do you know the person who you identify wants to be identified or wants to hear from you? Um, is that in some way invading privacy? If you call someone and say, I understand you're having problems, how do you answer that? Yeah, so we, that's a, another great question. We you know, some people don't want to share information, and there certainly are people who are ill who we're not aware of. You know, I think that's always a struggle in congregations that, and sometimes people are offended. Why wasn't I visited? You know, and yeah. no one, they never told us. And and some so some people really appreciate the phone calls and will continue to make them and others signal, you know, I'll let you know if I need further. You know, we try to be sensitive to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that Janet mentioned that, that I, I'd like to emphasize is about surveying people. Mm -hmm. Like you say, finding out, you know, sometimes you can do surveying where people will offer, as Jerry has been asking, uh, uh, you know, offer up that they have some concerns about being gay or about being a Jew of color or whatever. Uh, and um, and then you don't, and then I think it gets to Jerry's Jerry's question about, you know, what's invading their privacy. Um, if they've offered that to you uh, in, in some way. And I think, Janet, you mentioned about surveying people. The other thing you mentioned that I want to emphasize is connecting with people years ahead of when the event would be. So, you know, bar bat mitzvah, uh, and we think special kids ought to be able to be in the regular service doing the regular thing, right? I mean, that's the ultimate goal of, Absolutely. of all of us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you do, you have to prepare parents for that, don't you? And say, what do we need? You know, basically the answer is your kid has a right to have service on Saturday morning like any other kid. How are we going to do this? What's what's our plan? And as you say, Janet, that's a couple of years ahead of time. That's not just three weeks before. So that, that was great. Um, we have some questions in the chat I want to get to. Uh, let's see. Um, Janet, uh, you mentioned group homes in Buffalo, uh, I, I think, right? Who yeah. does, who, who do the group homes serve? Yeah, that, so we, um, back in 2004, someone, um, uh, the rabbi conducted a funeral on um, the mother. It was for a 50 year old woman who had intellectual disability. And the mother was so upset that she didn't live in a, a home where Judaism was observed. So we started a, a task force, um, a Jewish group homes task force to see who wanted to live in a, a Jewish, a home that had, um, that observed Jewish traditions. And five people came forward and New York state, it, it's totally based you know, on what your state will allow. Um, New York state at that time was looking to increase capacity and a, a home was formed for five, happened to be five women. We had an ice cream social with klezmer music and said, and you know, who wants to form a Jewish group home? Five, um, women, adult women um, formed the first home and eight women, that op home opened in 2007, eight women have had the opportunity to live there during that time period. And um, that home is fully embraced by, there are programs there all the time that um, Nickel City Jews, the young adults go over and have Shabbat there. We have a Havdalah program. Everyone can't have enough, you know, and the women host us. It's amazing, they have sukkah building parties there. So now we're trying to do it for 
um, men and my son Daniel is 30, we, um, I've been keeping my eyes out for other men who would, who would qualify for certified services because New York is trying to get people to live as independently as possible. Um, certified services, you know, or provide 24 seven care. And we have six men and we have been struggling with the state because the state doesn't want to create any more certified homes because they're more costly. Um, but we have the full support of federation and um, our local legislators and we're, we got semi approval for it, but it's been a real struggle. But we've through this Jewish group home task force, which now is called the Jewish community um, inclusion task force, which I'm the coordinator of, but you know, we keep, we try to let, again, organically, people come forward and tell us areas where they, there's a need that needs to be filled. And there is a need for people to be able to live in a Jewish environment after their parents are no longer able to keep them in, you know, um, take care of them in their homes as we're all mortal. Good, thank you. We have, uh, well, first of all, I should mention, we just have a couple of minutes here and we'll, we'll, we'll get out of here for you. Um, I, 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 I've been admonished by one of our attendees, appropriately so, that you know how you use a phrase and you don't think there's anything wrong with it? Um, there are plenty of people who say, Jew you down, right? And they don't think there's something wrong with it and we kind of react to that. Well, I'm told that the phrase low hanging fruit, which we have used uh, a few times here, is a is a real issue and um and uh that that for black folks yeah. there is a history of low-hanging fruit associated with lynching as opposed to you and i were thinking low-hanging fruit was like apples that you could pick without getting up on the ladder so you know these these sensitivities are things that i constantly learn more about as i'm working on this inclusion stuff we do have one last question here to grab um it's about mental health boy this is a tough one jerry jacobs asks a new pressing issue for our Jewish community, particularly those ages 12 to 18, is a dramatic increase in mental health struggles post-COVID. Everyone's impacted by loneliness, social challenges, uh, with a regretful increase in violence and suicide. Um, therapists often speak of the healing power of community. How can we add this urgent need to our agenda now? I, I, I think unless somebody has a better answer, I think the answer is just what you said, Jerry, we should add mental health onto our agenda now. And and you know, include that in our inclusive discussions. But obviously, uh, drug addiction, mental health, there are a lot of issues that that we that we we might want to take on, but they, you know, there's just I don't know how much how much bandwidth we have at the synagogue with respect to our clubs and affiliates. So I'm going to move into some closing remarks. I see Steve's hand is up, but wait, hold on, Steve. Let me let me make sure I do our closing remarks, and then we'll allow people to open up and talk, talk, talk a little bit. Um, and Steve, by the way, is an expert on the mental health question. So he'll, I'll, we'll let him talk to that. Um, got all that. Uh, thank you. Oh, the next session. I just want to mention to everyone that uh, Wednesday, May 10th, our next session will include Rabbi Adrian Rubin, who's Rabbi at Temple Beth Am Yisrael, Springfield, New Jersey. And she'll bring us her perspective on what she's done and how clergy can lead inclusion initiatives at their synagogue. Her work includes Keshet and the USCJ Leadership Project. We'll have Eric Perlman from Florida, Florida region. He'll be talking about his experiences. I think you'll be interested in that. Welcoming friends and family members from traditionally marginalized communities. And we'll have Jerry Jacobs, who's on with us now. He's a licensed social, a retired licensed social worker, a member of our inclusion initiative, special ed advocate, um, and he has other credentials that I'll, I'll skip, but but uh, basically Jerry also will be able to speak to uh, welcoming friends and family members uh, from marginalized communities. So we'll talk more about that then. We do wanna thank you for attending our Pride and Prejudice Zoom session. We hope to see you May 10th, if not sooner. Also wanna mention that at the FJMC convention in Philadelphia, we hope that uh, lots of you guys are registered or will register. We, we not only have what we think you'll find a very powerful panel of folks, but also have a, a breakout sessions to help you specifically with issues, uh, support or lack of support that you find in your own synagogue or with your club. Um, okay, that's my spiel and we will open it up. Feel free to unmute and talk. Let me start with Steve Mandel. If you have to go, feel free, but Steve, I'm sure has something important to tell us. Steve. More than a decade ago, 
uh, at Temple Central Synagogue in New York, a young man named Jed committed suicide. And as a result, his parents started the Jed Foundation. The Jed Foundation is a Jewish and also non-sectarian organization that reaches more than 2 million students per year. Um, they have spoken with me uh, in regards to um, being of assistance to any organization that wants to promote wellness uh, related either to mental health, suicide, and other challenges of youth. Their website is spectacular with multiple uh, MBAs, PhDs, and I would suggest that um, probably someone uh, like yourself, Jerry, or, or some leading person on the committee, contact them and see whether they may um, be of assistance to either partner in a program or even present uh, a program to our membership. So it's the J, just Google it, JED Foundation. And if you have any issues, then um, Phil, who um, um, and his wife started the program, I've spoken with them. I don't have any ongoing contact with them, but um, if you have difficulty, then contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mandel. Any other quick comments? From folks, feel free to unmute. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Barry Lichtenstein. And if I could just take a second, this is um, off topic from what a lot of, of what, a lot of what has been spoken, but it has a lot to do with the LGBT community. If you look at everybody's name on the screen that we're looking at, two of us have pronouns. And a lot of people think that pronouns, so, oh, I really don't need to do that. But the point of having pronouns up on your screen with your name at all times is exactly what inclusion is. If everybody puts their pronouns with their name, then the person that puts they there, as opposed to he, him, or she, her, is no longer separate from everybody else. It's just another person with their pronouns. So I really, and it's probably the simplest thing that you can do for everybody to show inclusion. And it's, like I said, super easy. And it actually shows personal commitment to inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. I've never heard that explanation like that. That's very, that's very smart. Appreciate that. Any other quick comments? Yes, Karen, go. Um, Whoops, Karen, you just you just muted yourself. There you go. I know. I I just thank you, Barry. I I just wanted to add to what to what Barry said that. Um, and I, I was just, I was just going to, as soon as he started talking, I was going to change my, rename myself, because that is so important. And that's one of the programs that Women's League is going to be doing. They're going to be talking about pronouns in April, as I, and I mentioned that before. It is so important that everyone feels included. So I identify as she, her, hers, and there are people that identify as he, him, or they, as, as Barry said. I have a, um, my middle daughter is, uh, is gay. She's married to a woman, um, and they both identify as she. Um, my grandson, one of my, their son is on the spectrum. Uh, so thank you, Janet, you're, uh, for saying what you said. Um, and I'm a widow. So if you want to talk about non-traditional families, here, here I am, you know, or here my family is. Um, but I, I just wanted to thank everyone for what they have talked about. And I so appreciate um, what everyone has said. Thank you, Karen. Did I see another hand up? Was there a, did I miss somebody? Um, could I, I'm sorry. Oh, sure, Janet, go ahead. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I just, I realize I'm, sometimes I'm 
I didn't listen to your question carefully, just on the question of group homes, who do they serve? It, it's um, so in New York State, it would be persons with developmental disability and to qualify, you know, one would need to have intellectual disability. Um, so that just to answer that question. And I also love um, what Barry suggested and and Karen's um, comments as well. You know, I, I love the, the notion that we sh if we're to make everything universal and, you know, that that helps everyone who wants to, someone who identifies as they, for example, would feel comfortable if we're all just using our pronouns rather than, um, you know, re removing the stigma for, for everything that we're able to do. That's such a, um, a wonderful suggestion. Thank you. And thank you so much. I've learned so much and I'm so inspired by all of you and um, Kolika Jerry for um, all of the initiatives and and the same for everyone here for for your pursuit of inclusion and belonging. I'm so grateful. Thank you, Janet. Anything else quickly? Otherwise, we're done. Appreciate everybody coming. We'll see you soon. Thank you.